that's fine. All right. Y'all may know that come January 1st, this school becomes Georgia State University. The big state university sometimes likes to do things differently than a junior college, a two-year junior college. And one of the things you will probably run into, and my daughter who goes to UGA ran into this, and I ran into it at UT, they want to give essay tests in lieu of other kind of tests, tests, multiple choice, fill in the blank. So I'm giving an essay as an option. If you don't like taking multiple choice tests, I'm going to give you about maybe anywhere from two to four essay questions to pick from it. This time it's different. I'm not going to tell you what the essays are, except to have some do with chapters 9 to 11, and some do with some things I've said in class. Um, but it'd be it's, it's optional. Now, later, come next semester, I'll probably be giving more essay tests, going to, again, it's just what I think they expect of a big university, a four-year, actually, university has a doctoral program, eight-year college instead of a two-year college. Um, okay, hopefully that clears up um, what I, okay. Um, so otherwise, the test is multiple choice. I want to say this about multiple choice test. Some of you can will tell me that you do so much better on the fill in the blank than most of you do. But the students who don't quite know the material can do really, really badly on a fill in the blank test. Really badly. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, the person I'm talking about is not here. So uh, the person or person, sorry, I'll leave that to you. All right. Okay, leaving that, we're on chapter uh, nine still. We ended up with, uh, let's see, a big city in a big, big forgotten city called Angkor Wat. Angkor Now, Angkor Wat was once the capital of um, what today is Cambodia, and it was a very large city, uh, and uh, after a time it was abandoned. Now, when Europeans first began visiting Cambodia, the Cambodians told them all deep in a jungle is a really, really big city. And of course, it reminded Europeans of the stories the Indians told the cities of Cebola. I mean, ah, that must be mythological. Well, one day, some explorer was going through the jungle, and all of a sudden, it's like the jungle just opened up, and there in front of him was this huge, huge city, totally devoid of human habitation. Nobody lived in it. And a six-foot-long black snake slid around across the street in front of him. He and the snake ignored each other. A tiger was inside one of the buildings. A tiger peeked its head out the window and looked at him, but he and the tiger ignored each other. He went on looking around the city and just awed by its size. He went back where he'd started from and told the other Europeans in the area where the city was, and they came and explored it. So they began to ask the natives, you know, what's the meaning of this city? What happened? And they learned that the city had been abandoned about 400 years before. In other words, in the 1500s or so, late 1500s, um, the city was abandoned. Now, uh, now, why was it abandoned? And what was the reason? Well, there were several reasons. One reason, the city was made of stone. And the problem they have, they have with stone structures is when they start to crumble and decay, they are very, very difficult to repair. It's not like this building. This building gets so old that they feel like it's no longer capable of being repaired. All they got to do is get a bulldozer and a wrecking ball or whatever, a big crane, and take it away. And it can all be removed in about a matter of a week or two, the whole thing. And a new one started up in its place. I mean, but a stone structure with stones that sometimes weigh tons, 
it's not that easy to remove all the old stones and stones you know, as, as they heat and cool and heat and cool and expand and contract the stones start to chip away and uh, then eventually the whole the stones don't fit together like they once did the earth might tremor a little bit and the stones shift and move a little bit and after a while the buildings become unsafe that was one thing but another real reason though the city was abandoned was due to the fact that they simply could not handle the barbarians who lived around it. This was a city deep in the jungle, visiting civilization, and were surrounded by people who were, we might call uncivilized, and focus has been the case throughout so much of human history. When uncivilized and civilized meet, usually the uncivilized win. This was no exception. Angkor's wealth began to decline. A group of people called the Thai, from which we get the word Thailand, came in. The kings of Angkor Wat then had enemies on all sides. And after a while, the people of Angkor just decided to move out. And they rebuilt another city nearby. Well, not, not nearby, but some distance away called Phnom Penh. The city of Phnom Penh is still standing. And Phnom Penh is not built like Angkor, it's not built of solid stones, it's built of buildings that can be taken down and reconstructed if they want to. Um, not now. There's another issue with Angkor, and I'll be repeating this probably later. Now, again, folk, I don't know anything at all, or not much about the religious convictions of any of you, and I never do ask, and, uh, unless you choose to tell me. But the kings of Angkor changed religions. At first, the first kings were Hindu. And under Hinduism, these kings were energetic, striving, outgoing, conquering, getting things done, keeping things moving. Then along the way, some of these kings were introduced to Buddhism and they adopted Buddhism. And Buddhism made them accept what is, in effect, made them more passive. Uh, so they live a life of meditation and contemplation. And uh, if trouble comes your way, just accept it as being the will of God. Don't try to, uh, or the will of heaven, don't, don't try to change it. Just simply be, uh, just be content with what's happening. And the result was the city began to crumble and decline. As was the case, though, with all civilizations, the civilization of Angkor declined from within before it declined from without. Um, along also came the Burmans, from which we get the name Burma. They came in. They were uncivilized people, but gradually, they, they were pastoral people. You might call them uncivilized. But they eventually set up their own state and uh, started to civilize themselves. To make a long story short, this region here was very strongly influenced by India, so much so that uh, they were called the East Indies Islands, partly because of East India. They were very strongly influenced by India, but they tended to adopt Buddhism more so than they did any other religion, particularly as they became more civilized and left the uh, pantheistic religions, animism, pantheism, shamanism. As they left behind these religions that are generally associated with more primitive people, uncivilized people, they uh, began to become uh, Hindu or Buddhist, and with Buddhism eventually triumphing. All right. We'll move on. Chapter 11. Um, China's dynasties, the main ones we'll talk about here, starting with the Han, that we mentioned in, in chapter 5. Starting with the Han, and then moving on to a period of chaos. 
otherwise known as the era of six dynasties. None had control. The six dynasties were finally replaced by the Sui, the Tang, and the Sun. That's spelled in English, S-O-N-G, but the book says, and I've had Chinese students tell me it's pronounced Sun. And finally, the Yuan, or the Mongol, I'll put that here, otherwise Mongolian. This time, unlike the, when, I, when I said about India, I do want you to learn the names of these dynasties. In the case of India, I just didn't. In this case, yes. Um, yes? Are we not doing chapter 10? Say again? Are we not doing chapter 10? That's exactly the chapter I'm starting on right now. Oh, you said 11. Did I say 11? Mm -hmm. My bad, my bad. All right, what I meant to say was 10. Uh, chapter 11 is Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, which I hope to get to on, on Wednesday. Today is chapter 10. And uh, yeah, I'm on chapter 10, the medieval China. And in fact, yeah, I, sorry if I called it chapter 11. Uh, China is the one topic I find the most interesting of all these. All right, now, folk, a lot of persons have done some comparative history, and they compare European history to Indian history to Chinese history. And they all have one thing in common. About the year two and three and four hundred CE, all three of them, their civilizations went downhill. In the case of Europe, Europe went down farther than the others. China did not quite go down as far as India. But and eventually they all recovered, with Europe finally destined to rise higher than the others and China and India perhaps not a side, but um, now, what likely, I mean, you know what I'm about to say, I think, what likely brought about the decline? Most likely it was due to global cooling. Now, folk, I don't know how many of you heard this, but today I'm talking about this very day, November 2nd. They have an article on MSN that NASA has just discovered that the Antarctic ice sheet, down here in Antarctica, the Antarctic ice sheet is getting bigger. What does this mean? It means that the Earth might be starting to cool back down. Um, it's there, folk, on MSN. Look at www.msn.com, and it's got a big, bold headline that NASA has been studying the Antarctic ice sheet. And uh, they say, well, a big problem, we don't really know for sure sure how to measure it, but it looks like it's getting bigger. All right. The, what I'm saying, folks, and this is pure history, these things appear to move in cycles, waves, up and down, up and down, and mankind really has no control over it, and no, mankind does not start it. What does? The sun might change its temperature or deep down in the earth, there might be a rising. Some people believe El Nino forms deep in the Pacific Ocean and rise to the surface for reasons we do not understand. However, the climate appears to have cooled. And after the fall of the Han Dynasty, China went through a period of chaos. The Mongolians came in from the north, just like they had in, I mean, just like barbarians had come in in Europe. The Mongolians were possibly urged south by a lot of pooling in Mongolia. So the Mongolians came down and uh, they conquered a lot of northern China. Southern China split into, they call it six dynasties. One generation it might have been five, another generation seven or so, but no one had charge. And this was to last for some 400 years. Um, India did not unite until the 1500s and then only largely because of foreign influence. China was able to unite itself in the 600s. As for Europe, Europe never has united again to this day, but that's something else. Um, actually, personally, I think that China being united might have been a big handicap. Well, why is that? If China had been divided into 50 different countries speaking 50 different languages, 
one of them might have found the way towards high technology and towards democracy and burst out and burst from its seams and just like happened in Europe as it was when they got united. That's the story I'm about to tell for the rest of the class. They got united and they, uh, they took a wrong path. All right, China continued to build up until though by the time Marco Polo got here in the 1300s, China was the richest nation on earth. Yes, very wealthy and the most advanced kingdom, the most advanced scientifically. <clears throat> China, like a lot of these old countries, and we in the United States can't appreciate this, but China looked back to its history and said things were really wonderful there, we must rebuild what they had. China began to believe in the cyclical view of history, the history is cyclical, that is it goes in waves, you go up and then down, up and down, up and down in cycles. And, uh, and a lot of this was these waves were based on the as the forces of yin and yang interacted it affected china the chinese however when they rebuilt their country in the beginning in the seven and eight hundreds the new china did not really resemble the old china yeah that's straight out of the book the old china had been in one way the new china was somewhat different all right Now, um, one thing that was going on during this period of time that your book starts to talk about, touches on, then goes into more depth later, was that the principles of Confucius, hard work, obedience to authority, orderliness, this was Confucianism, but Confucius lacked any, hardly any spirituality, whatever. So new to a, two new religions came on the scene, Buddhism and Taoism, they were not new. But they came in and they threatened Confucianism. Now, folk, this is a case of India. India was threatened by Buddhism, but Hinduism triumphed. China was threatened by both the more spiritual Buddhism and Taoism. But Confucianism was always the dominant religion of China, just like Hinduism was always a dominant religion of India. Um, Buddhism never took over India, and Buddhism and Taoism never took over China. But they did make a threat, and in both cases, these new religions forced the mainstream religion to change. In the case of India, India became more egalitarian, Hinduism became more egalitarian. In the case of China, Confucianism became a little bit more spiritual than uh, it had been before. Now, Buddhism did not make a lot of headway because of its foreign origins. Um, it, was, it was attacked because the Chinese tended to not like religions that were foreign in origin, particularly Buddhism. Now, something your book does not mention, but I'm going to throw in. Christianity was introduced to China as early as 100 CE, and wave after wave of Christian missionaries have gone to China every century from the time of Christ. And in general, they have not gotten far, owing to the fact that the Chinese people do not like foreign religions and they look on Christians as a foreign religion. But in 1949, the Chinese embraced the most foreign religion of all when they embraced communism. And yes, I call communism a religion. You can argue with that if you want. But the Chinese in 1949 embraced the foreign, embraced Karl Marx. All right. After some 400 years of chaos, the Sui dynasty united China, brought order to the region, and China has been united from that day to this. However, the conqueror of the, the, the Sui dynasty wanted a unifying ideology, and he really he said to himself, now, Confucianism didn't do it. So I will embrace both Buddhism and Taoism, believing that they will unite China. So he himself, as emperor, embraced Buddhism and both Buddhism and Taoism. But the mainstream of people, most of Chinese, still remain Confucian. Um, there was an attempt made to reconcile Buddhism with Confucianism. 
they tried and couldn't. Buddhism emphasizes contemplation and acceptance of what is. Confucius emphasized hard work, obedience to authority. The two ideologies were worlds apart. And um, also Buddhism had a lot to say about the afterlife, getting higher and higher. The Chinese cared little about, seemed like cared little about the afterlife. The two religions could not uh, get together. Um, the, this emperor, I'm not going to worry about his name, but his son built the Grand Canal. You can't see it on the map here, but the Grand Canal joined the Yellow and the Yangtze rivers. Very important. Now, the Grand Canal is still in service in China. The Chinese have kept it open for all these hundreds of years, actually more than a thousand years. But the Grand Canal, and uh, why is canal building important? Until the invention of the railroad, the canal was the easiest way to get a large volume of goods over land, from one land route to another. A half lame horse, just one horse could pull tons of weight, barge weight. Um, again, as long as he was pulling over a canal. Weights that he could not pull with a wagon, but uh, in other words, it didn't even take a strong horse to pull. Yes? I remember you saying the yellow and the white. The yellow and Yangtze. Yeah, two of China's big rivers. Uh, the Grand Canal joined the two of them. And again, the Grand Canal is still in service. Um, this dynasty, though, the Sui dynasty only lasted two generations. The father was okay to deal with, the son was a tyrant. And uh, when he died, the dynasty came to an end. The people of China simply refused to put this sons on it. The, the, the uh, third one of the Swede on the throne. And the dynasty came to an end. The Tang dynasty took over. I shouldn't have erased those so fast. But the Tang, and it was to last 300 years. Now, the Tang dynasty was a very energetic, outgoing dynasty. And to this day, a lot of the Chinese look back with nostalgia to the Tang. This was a time of our glory. They conquered Tibet. They eventually lost Tibet, then they conquered it again. And, uh, speaking of Tibet, there used to be a professor who would come here every day, and I don't know where he is. Now, maybe he traded cars. But he had a sign on his bumper sticker, Free Tibet. Um, a lot of, there's, that's still a big issue because a lot of people want to see Tibet free from China. President Barack Obama will not have anything to do with the Dalai Lama, who's the head of the Tibet movement, because he does not want to offend China any more than he already has. So Tibet, it was freed for a while, and then it was conquered, freed, and reconquered. The uh, Tang Dynasty put Korea to tribute and demanded tribute from a lot of the Manchurian people <coughs> living up here. Um, Korea, these people of Manchu. In other words, they became wealthy. They became they made sure that China was the undisputed master of all of East Asia. They never conquered Japan. In fact, Japan was destined to never lose a war until 1945. Uh, Japan was an, is an island the back has just four big islands off the coast of uh, Korea. And um, the Japanese were very able to remain independent even when the Chinese were very powerful. But the, uh, the capital of, the, uh, uh, of China under the uh, Tang was over. The capital city had more than 2 million people. But the problems occurred after a while. After a few hundred, a couple hundred years, court people started fighting each other. Court intrigue, and this is a problem that emperors often have to deal with. An emperor can't deal with it when his brother and his uh, another brother start fighting each other over some issue uh, or uh, maybe an uncle starts fighting against the emperor and uh, corruption and folk people in government much much too often down through the age have been tempted to steal public money and put it in their own pockets find a way and this is this is universal among mankind Every government has had corrupt officials at one time or another, and the United States is no exception. And um, right this morning when I was coming in, I heard on the news that some former senator was about to go to jail because of some corrupt dealing he did. I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem. 
Um, so the Tang Dynasty was somewhat undermined. Now, um, eventually the Tang Dynasty was overthrown, and for 200 years, China was, not 200 years, probably for two generations, there was about, oh, 60 or so years, China was somewhat chaotic. Officially, they were united, but uh, nobody was really in charge. Then came the Song Dynasty, spelled S-O-N-G. Now, the Song Dynasty was to last, I don't recall, I'm sorry, I don't recall how many generations, but it was several. Um, I've had a little bit of a fascination studying this particular dynasty. The dynasty set out as their goal to help the poor. Sounds very noble, folk, but it proved to be their undoing. Now, let me face and say, helping the poor is really, really great. Everybody should do it as individuals. The government has no business helping the poor, any government. What happens, the government gets all broken up and collapses. This is exactly what happened to Sun. I personally think the Sung was an example of a socialistic dynasty. They tried to, to make the poor equal. They took lands from the rich. The Tang dynasty before we've done this a little bit. They took lands from the rich, redistributed on the poor. In the case of the Chinese, it actually worked for a little while, but the nobility found a way to get around it, and eventually the idea was abandoned. Um, also, Tibet, which had been conquered by the Tang, Tibet revolted and found its way loose. Now, here's another problem that socialistic people have, liberals in particular. They don't want to admit that there's such a thing as war, and sometimes you have to make it. And this was to be the Song Dynasty. And under the Song, several things went right. They invented numerous inventions, which we're about to name and list. The country generally prospered. They were a dynasty of music, uh, the word song, music, uh, art. They made a lot of progress, again, technologically, scientifically, and they tried to help the poor. But, oh, we don't need a strong army. I mean, fighting, that's dirty, nasty business. And I'll make a long story short, they wound up being conquered by the Mongolians of the north. And again, they had millions of people in Genghis Khan's army, only had 100,000 men, and the Chinese had millions. How in the world did Genghis Khan do it? Well, the Chinese did not stand up to him and fight. Simply, I mean, Tibet, Tibet should never have been able to get their independence, but they did. Um, anyway, um, after a few generations, the prosperity, yes, of generally peaceful times, the uh, Mongolians came in under Genghis Khan, overthrew the, the uh, Song Dynasty and established the Yuan Dynasty. Now, I want to clarify something that I didn't even know until a couple of semesters ago when I was shown up in my old class. Genghis Khan did not conquer all of China. He started to, he conquered part of it. Then Genghis Khan turned his attention to conquering or just simply not even conquered, just going out and slaughtering a lot of the Muslim world. But his, his grandson, now Kublai Khan, did conquer all of China. Genghis Khan himself started to. He defeated several Chinese armies, and he established Mongol rule in China, but he did not have all of China. He, like other Mongolians, he had the northern part of China, but never got the whole thing. His grandson, Kublai Khan, got it all. Anyway, Genghis Khan set up the Mongol dynasty, and uh, that's where the political history ends for the time being, I mean, for this, for this chapter. All right, now, I'm following along the way the book does. The book digresses now from the political history to the um, um, other aspects of their history, particularly the political structures. As I've already mentioned, Confucianism was threatened by Buddhism and Daoism, but eventually Confucius 
one. And the Confucianism won out. Partly because they had became more spiritual, which I will talk about in a few minutes. All right, the civil service examination. That was a part of it. During the Song Dynasty especially, the Chinese emperors realized that we want to have control. We want to see to it that when a nobleman dies, that his office is not passed on to his son, who might be incompetent. So they reinstated the civil service exam. And the purpose of the civil service exam was to determine who got the government positions um, the emperors may have liked it because it gave them more control over who the officials were and if they didn't like an official or thought an official was too rebellious they could use the civil service exam as an excuse to replace it. And here are some characteristics, characteristics of the exam. Members of the court, you know, members of the royal family were not allowed to take it. Eunuchs were not allowed to take it. Women were not allowed to take it. And you might think, well, it created the egalitarianism, not quite, because China had no public education system, which meant that most men had no chance at all of passing it. Only the richer men could, whose parents were able to afford tutors, had a chance to be able to read it and pass it. The exam consists of three parts, like a lower level, intermediate, higher level. And I'm going to use 21st century American terms here. Persons who pass on the lower level might get city jobs, jobs in the city government or county jobs. Persons who pass at the intermediate level would get jobs like on a state level, and persons who pass at the third level would get jobs on a federal level. Now that's using 21st century language, but the idea was the same. Persons who passed the first level got jobs on the village level. The ones who passed <coughs> the next level got jobs on the intermediate level, which would include several villages. And then the ones who passed the highest could qualify for positions in the central government. Now, not everybody who passed the exam got a job. There had to be a job available. I mean, it's like in the Army. If, uh, if a person gets the rank of captain, he has to immediately qualify for the rank of major and then try to step in any time there's an opening. But there has to be an opening before he can step into the rank of major. If there's no opening, after nine years as a captain, he gets kicked out of the Army. Uh, due to no fault of his, perhaps. He can still re-enter the Army as an enlisted man. But um, there has to be an opening. It's like becoming Pope. Before you become Pope, the present Pope has to either die or resign. If he doesn't, while well, you're cardinal, then you have no chance. But uh, anyway, so you weren't guaranteed that you would get a job. There had to be an opening for the job. Um, now, it is known that some people cheated on the exams. All right, now, folk, here's the fun part. I'm about to say something I said, oh, it's been about eight years ago, and one of my pupils went straight to the department head and told on me for saying it. The department head wrote me a nice note, and I wrote one back that anyone can say anything they want to in my class, and how that I just recently had a Vietnamese communist in my class. I mean, hey, he was a likable fellow, but let me run. I, when I call him a Vietnamese, I call him, only because he was a Vietnam. Always slander. When I call him a communist, I'm calling him that because that was just what he told me his whole view was. So, yes, he was a Vietnamese communist. He got an A in my class. Well deserved. He wrote an article about the Vietnam War, and uh, he wrote it from a personal point of view. He was too young to fight him, so he heard it from his father and grandfather how the wicked United States came in and tried to conquer and take over them, and how that they rose up and drove the Americans out. He got an A on the paper. Again, not that I agree with his opinions. All right, this is what I wound up telling my park manager. I mean, hey, I had kind of bothered me. I mean, I lost a whole night's sleep over it. But our present department head has said that we can say anything we want to. And we want to try to be careful. Here's what I said. All right. In ancient, I mean, in medieval China, the civil service exam were slanted towards Confucianism. Oh, that's in the book. You read the book. You had to memorize large portions of Confucian in order to pass a text. Well, what if you were a Buddhist? Unless you indoctrinated yourself in Confucian doctrine, you did not have much of a chance of that because they, they wanted Confucians to get government positions. All right. What does this apply to the United States? Our exams, particularly the graduate record exam that gets you into graduate school, and our national teacher exam that can determine promotions for teachers, our national examinations are slanted toward the left. 
outcome that 52 professors, all history professors at Duke University, all 52 of them were liberal Democrats. Hey, if you don't know what I mean, you wait until you get higher up and you're going to find, maybe not so much here in the Bible Belt, you know, I ran into this at UT, you're going to find more and more communistic, meaning leftist, socialistic professors the higher you get. I said that and someone told on me. I'm still here. We're supposed to have academic freedom. Anyway, I made a remark that we do the same thing in some ways that they did. They slanted towards Confucianism in order to get Confucian people in the government positions. We slant ours toward the left in order to get leftists high up in academia. Now, if I'm wrong, I'll listen. You can tell me. Where do you take the exam yourself? And you might notice the slant. I did. I took the national teacher exam and I took the graduate record exam and they were slanted towards the left. All right. Um, nevertheless, the Chinese did have more equality in getting government positions to the qualified persons than anyone else. And I did have a few questions. Them, How does a high score on a test guarantee that you'll be a good government official? Well, folks, it, it doesn't. But at least... Um, at least you have to have some criteria by which you pick your government officials. Um, and also, there were a few cases where that the uh, head of a village might notice some young boy who came from poverty, but who appeared to be really, really bright and a fast learner. This official would sometimes groom this fellow. A few persons rose up from poverty to a fairly high position. Was this official might educate this young boy and? Uh, he might eventually be able to take the exams and move up to, in society. And every, every society and every generation has had people who started out in dirt poor poverty conditions and who have risen high up. And it doesn't happen often, but it happens, like I say, in every generation and every society. Economically, China was to remain primarily agricultural. Under the Sun, there was a lot of economic growth. But unfortunately, a lot of Chinese families wound up in serfdom of slavery, or Chinese individuals wound up in serfdom of slavery. Both the Tang Dynasty and the uh, Sung Dynasty tried redistribution, taking lands from the rich, redistributing among the poor. Did not work. And I challenge anyone to find an instance where it ever has. It has been tried in Mexico. It's been tried more than once in China. It was tried in Korea, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. Never has worked. Um, what did help the poor somewhat, though, were inventions, which uh, we'll talk about in a few minutes. Well, no, some of the inventions, uh, steel, porcelain, cotton was introduced, um, again, the Chinese were the inventors of steel, and as far as the inventors of porcelain, maybe the first people in the world to grow cotton. And, uh, oh yes, in the area of farming, they were the first ones to put a collar on a horse, on a horse's shoulders rather than his neck. Something, uh, the Europeans learned these things from the Chinese, by the way. Um, so again, they made many and numerous inventions that should have propelled them to the top. Trade, very important to have a, uh, eventually the Chinese uh, developed private commerce. Again, this is, seems to be working better instead of government controlled trade. At first the government controlled trade, but eventually private individuals set up their own trading companies. Um, trade though with Rome, or trade with Europe, all but stopped. The Silk Road, got to the Muslim world and generally stopped there because the Muslims had a lot to trade with the Chinese. Europe did not. Europe had run out of gold and silver and Europe had nothing that China wanted. Now, folk, this was to uh, hurt China because in the late 1700s, the King of England, George III, sent an ambassador to China to try to convince the Chinese import to trade with England. And that's the Chinese emperor said, Europe has nothing that China wants. 
By this time, Europe had plenty that China needed, but the Chinese were used to feeling we're better and we're superior and we don't need what these barbaric Europeans have. This was to be China's undoing later. But anyway, the Chinese did not trade much with Europe, but in their trade, a lot of the trade through the Silk Road ran through steep mountains and dry deserts, and there were a lot of bandits and highwaymen lurking and waiting for them. So a lot of the Chinese then began to trade by ship, and they would, the Chinese built some of the biggest ships that the world had seen up to that time. And it is believed strongly that they built wooden sailing vessels that had about eight or nine masts that were 450 feet long. Uh, now, the reason I bring this up, folks, did any of you happen to see the Bill Nye and Ken, ha Ken Ham debates from early last year? Bill Nye brought up that my ancestors were shipbuilders and they built a 300 foot long ship that began leaking immediately. Yes, the 300 foot long ship that Bill Nye's ancestors built was actually poorly built. But nevertheless, see, Bill Nye was saying that the Ark Noah could not have been 450 foot long because you can't build a wooden vessel 450 foot long. Well, the Chinese claimed that they did. The only proof we have is the written records for one, and we found a rudder. The rudder would only have been used in a 450 foot long vessel. It would have weighted down in any vessel any smaller. So uh, now, also, Bill Nye's ancestors built a ship that actually floated for some 12 years before a big storm came up and the storm was over, the ship disappeared. <coughs> Nevertheless, the Chinese are known to have taken teak wood, which is a very hard wood, and buried it several feet in the ground and covered it over several years. Then it would dig this wood back up, and they did it. It was really, really super hard. And with this, they built sailing vessels. Also, Alexander the Great sailed on a wooden sailing vessel that had been built by the Greeks that is believed to have been 450 foot long. So, great all now, having said that, the Chinese sailing vessels are known to have gone to Africa. And here in Africa, they got some uh, African uh, ze uh, zebras and especially giraffes. And the Chinese emperor was really fascinated by these long-necked giraffes. Um, they brought back uh, some really strange and exotic animals that they had that the emperor kept in his Chinese zoo, including hippopotamus and whatever. Um, also, now this, this is in the book, and we had a professor here that wrote an article about it. It is now known that Chinese sailing vessels sail all the way to California and back. Now, I had a daughter to point out to me that, of course, the, Ch the Chinese didn't stay in California, by the way, did not settle, that the distance from Europe to the New World is less than half the distance from China to California, and that is true. Nevertheless, the Chinese built these huge sailing vessels. Now, in addition, they began to set up other institutions that should have really propelled them. banks. Credit, paper money. Folk, these people were on their way. They were on their way to developing scientifically. I mean, hey, steel, I mean, you might not really have important it is, but without steel, we could not have bridges going across the Mississippi River. You can't build a bridge across the Mississippi out of wood. And you can't build it out of iron either. Steel is made primarily of iron, but it's lighter than iron. It's iron mixed with other elements, most notably magnesium. It doesn't rust as fast as iron does. It's stronger than iron. It's more versatile. You can sometimes you can harden it to such a hardness it will not bend, or sometimes you can bend it. You can make springs out of it. It's very difficult. I don't think you can make springs out of iron, but you can out of steel. So there's several things you can do with steel. Uh, oh yeah, the building of skyscrapers was impossible until steel. The tall skyscrapers are built primarily of steel. The World Trade Center was made of steel and glass. The uh, Empire State Building is steel, yes, but steel that's covered over with concrete and rock, or concrete to where the, the uh, and if the, by the way, if the World Trade Center, if there were steel beams and protected by concrete, the World Trade Center tower would still be standing. As it was, it was plain old bare steel and glass, and when the planes hit into them, the heat from the flames weakened the steel enough to where the steel would not hold the rest of the building and it all came tumbling down. 
But anyway, now, banks, folk. How important is the bank? Simply this. Now, if you're in the business of making something like washcloths and tiles, you can get a steady flow of income for you because these things sell at a steady rate. But when you work at a place like Lockheed, like I did for 27 years, there were times when I was at Lockheed when Lockheed did not sell an airplane for a period of four or five months. We built about a whole dozen airplanes one time and found they had a defect that we had to solve before we could sell it. And uh, we eventually, our engineers got to work on it, the customers' engineers got to work on it. Eventually we solved the bugs and then sold a whole bunch of planes. So what I'm getting at is supposing that Lockheed could not have paid its employees during the time that the planes were not selling. We might work five, six months without getting paid and all of a sudden we get six months worth of pay in one day. Now supposing, now in my case, in the entire time I was there, my paycheck was always electronically mailed to me. I never carried it out. Never. Now, supposing now that Lockheed would pay its workers six months back pay and say, hey, everybody line up, we'll pay in gold and silver coins. Well, that would have taken days on end to pay us all, number one. But number two, the whole city of Marietta, the whole area would have suffered during the time that Lockheed's workers were not being paid. In addition, the Lockheed workers would have their mortgages closed on them, foreclosed on them, and have their cars repossessed and all that. What I'm getting at, the reason Lockheed was able to pay a steady was it had a bank account and a system of credit. So during the time Lockheed was not selling planes, the money flowed steadily. We got our paychecks every week. Actually, no, I didn't get a check. I got my money electronically transferred every week and everybody else did too. And there was a steady flow of income that would not have been possible, folk, had it not been for banks and had it not been for credit. All right, paper money. You cannot have a complex economy without paper money. Simply, I mean, um, simply it can. Now, of course, today money is mostly electronic and uh, folk, there are dire warnings that one of these days the sun is going to flare up and destroy our electronic internet system. That might happen. A big flare up did occur just a few weeks ago in Mist Earth. Any of you heard about this from another source outside? You did, yeah. The reason I'm interested is I'm a ham radio operator and the sun's uh, energy greatly affects how well radio communications travel. And right now the sun's cycle is Way, way down, and some people believe that the last time it went this low was in the 1600s and was followed by the Ice Age. All right, but leaving that for the moment. Um, now, here's what happened. I mean, they, these people were on their way. Paper money. Along comes came some philosophers and convinced the emperors: you must close your banks. Credit. Some credit leads to greed, and also it leads to some people becoming overextended and deep in debt. Folk, you know what it reminds me of? There are a lot of people living in this world who will not fly an airplane because airplanes sometimes crash, so they go out on a bill. And you have to see the bad logic. The automobile is the most dangerous contraption ever invented by man, and it's far more dangerous than an airplane. You might not think so when you're about to crash this, but they News does not report the planes that make it. They only report the planes that don't. I mean, the traffic is so bad, that, you know, this particular day, I woke up at the regular time, I mean, the old time, which means I woke up at 3.30 instead of 4.30. I knew it was raining, so I got up. First thing I did was check the school's website to see if they had closed the school on kind of flooding. They didn't. But I was kind of hoping, so I left my house before I got here at 6 o'clock instead of 7. You know, 7 o'clock the old time, 6 o'clock the new. Traffic was bad. Really bad. And the one morning class, when the class started, only four pupils had showed up at 8.30. Eight, eight wound up on about 8 or 10. Did. Anyway, um, what am I getting at? Uh, simply, the idea that credit does lead, credit in fact at times does lead to people overextending and leads to greed. 
So the Chinese stopped their banks, closed their banks, got rid of their paper money, and a lot of the progress was stopped. And speak life in traditional China, the cities became the abode eventually of merchants, artists, entertainers, industrialists. In other words, they began to act like cities. And they set up the entertainment houses, uh, theaters, and merchants and artists as they began to, more and more of them began to leave the farms. In the countryside, a lot of new rich people took over the land. The new rich, you know, like I said, there's always been people who have risen up by their own bootstraps and got wealthy. They wound up taking over the land, and they also wound up taking over the offices, the old nobility also. Um, the family was the basic unit, and when I say family, I mean everybody who was descended from the same great-great-grandfather on your father's side. It was your father's, 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 father, up and down. I mean, granted, if you might say, well, we have eight great-great-grandfathers, that's true. But it was the one on your father. And if you were descended from the same great, 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 great grandfather on your father's side, you were considered part of the same family. It was basically what we call an extended family. The family was a basic unit. Now, in Chinese society, females were considered inferior. And folk, this is something else. Uh, in time of famine, female babies were often killed. This practice was to be repeated in the 20th century. And in fact, when China became so concerned about its population, it passed a law that the couples weren't allowed to have one child. A lot of couples would kill their female babies. And the result was a generation of Chinese young men grew up who could not find wives because there were none. Now, how many of you have heard this from outside? Right. OK, several, a few of you nodding your heads have yeah, heard this. I mean, it's hard. the reason I keep asking that is it's hard for me to believe that this is supposed to actually happen. Now, folks, just in the last week, China passed a new law that married couples now can have two babies, two children per couple. Um, but um, if you have more, you have to go through a process of involuntary abortion or perhaps pay a huge fine. But uh, they now have the law that couples will have two babies. But at one time, Back, back to the time period we're talking about, a lot of girls were killed, and a lot of impoverished girls, girls from poor families, if they were attractive, they were often sold as concubines to the rich, to be a, a concubine for the rich, or they were hired out to the rich as domestic servants. Now, this is something that was going on for hundreds of years. Young Chinese girls had their, foot, their feet bound in order to make their feet smaller. Now, foot binding was to last, like I said, for about probably a thousand years. The practice was only outlawed in the 1950s after the communists took over. But in some places in rural China, they get the news, and your authors say that when they visited China in the 1980s, they still saw women who had their feet down. Their feet never grew after they got to be about a year old or so. And because they wore these tight shoes, would not let their feet grow. And this meant that the women had to walk in a crippled manner. But supposedly this changed the shape of their legs that made them more attractive to the men. Now, I had an American boy speak up in one of my classes. And, I don't find crippled women attractive. I said, I don't either. But you're a 21st century American male. We American males generally don't find that attractive. But the Chinese men, for hundreds of years, in fact, did find this attractive. The nearest thing in the West that we do the same thing is our women used to, I don't see this much anymore, but used to wear high heels. And my mother explained to me, oh, high heels uh, make the women more attractive to men. Maybe they did, but the high heels also bought on palms with corns, bunions, fallen arches, ingrown toenails, and planter warts. Hopefully none of you know anything about any of those. But, and being a man, I haven't had a for two of those myself, yes? Were they originally um, made for men in butcher shops so that they could be able to collect it, it might have. It might have been. I have, so I have not heard that. And the women may have taken them up, but it might have been made in butcher shops. Or it might have been. And uh, yes, I've had four ingrown toenail surgeries in my time, and my son had one also. And yes, this last summer I went off some along because of plantar wart. Um, but then the plantar wart was not caused by bad shoes. The plan of work was caused by sitting in the hospital for hours on end with a sick friend. 
sitting there and one of my leg popped up like so and after a while I walked through one of my wife's friends. But uh, that may be excuse, but whatever. Anyway, the Chinese women would bind their feet. And um, a few women became really prominent in China. Just a few, though. All right. This brings us up to Genghis Khan. Unlike the other great world conquerors, Genghis Khan is the only one who can be truly said to have started off in real poverty. I mean, Alexander the Great was the son of the richest king in his part of the world. Julius Caesar was a member of a wealthy Roman family. And of course, Cyrus the Great was a member of the royal house of the Achaemenidae in Persia. But Genghis Khan, his father had been an impoverished nobleman. And then his father was poisoned when young Genghis was only 10. When Genghis was, I mean, he, it was his duty to take over what was left of the tribe, but all the men in the tribe just stopped and left, and all he had to rule over was a bunch of, what was some women? Was, he had, and for about eight or nine years, he led these women. At one point, he was in prison, and at another point, he was mistreated, but nevertheless, when he grew up, apparently he had some charm about him. He was able to, sweet talk a few local tribes into joining with them. And from there he went on to do what his, no one in Mongolia had ever done. He united all the Mongolians under one big country. All the Mongolian tribes. Now folk I recently read that some people who did not conform left Mongolia and you'll never guess where they went. Went all the way across the seas and came to the United States and a lot of American Indians we encountered looked very, very Mongolian, yes. Were you talking about Genghis Khan like several times? Oh, already, Genghis several Genghis. times already, yes. But this yeah. time, I mean, because his his life touched the Muslim world, he touched the Chinese world, but this time I'm actually going into more detail about his personal life. Um, by the way, we find more people in the world carrying Genghis Khan's DNA than we find with anybody else. It's like half the people living in this part of the world, apparently they're carrying Genghis Khan that DNA. Now, they, either they're descended from him or descended from his ancestors, but uh, he had a unique feature about his DNA that uh, is found throughout. Anyway, um, then he was persuaded finally to conquer China. He was hesitant because he knew that all he had was 100,000 men. I mean, they were ex excellent fighters. But when he finally was persuaded to conquer China, he went to the wall of China. The Song Dynasty was in charge. And I recall reading when I was a, I read the book twice about him. Once when I was in the sixth grade, then read it again in graduate school. And my boss at the University of Tennessee said, oh, that's a famous classic. I guess it was a title of Genghis Khan and the Mongol Horde. But he, uh, to get it around the wall, I mean, to get, to get through the wall, he just simply had his men gallop up and down the wall. The Chinese were terrified at first. And at first, they were falling everywhere he moved, they moved. But then, after a few several weeks of this, the Chinese got complacent. And one day, Genghis Khan moved, and the Chinese army did not move. And Genghis Khan noticed that the gate he was standing in front of now was not very heavily fortified. So he got his men with a battering ram, and they rammed down the gate. And he and his 100,000 horsemen flowed right inside the wall. And at that point, China was just plunged into utter total chaos because, again, they had millions of men. Why didn't they fight? They were not trained. They had not joined the army. They had lived a life of ease and luxury and enjoyed the finer things of life, the art, the music, or none of which is wrong. But as is typical of liberal fashion, they just simply did not realize that sometimes you're invaded by these outside enemies and you either fight or perish. In this case, the Chinese mostly perished. Um, Genghis Khan then, after conquering part of China, he went on and invaded the Muslim world and got to here and uh, hoped his men, when they crossed the tall Himalayan mountains, they didn't carry much food with them, but they would, uh, they would survive by opening up the blood veins of their horses and mules and donkeys, whatever, and drink some of the blood. Then go, that would last the whole day. Then the next day they do the same thing and they kept drinking some of the blood. And the, the horses and mules' bodies would replenish the blood they drank. And this was how they survived. I mean, these people were wild and barbaric, to say the least. When they got to where they were going, they slaughtered the inhabitants just for the sheer fun of slaughter. Your book mentions how the Genghis Khan thoroughly enjoyed 
killing, uh, just for its own sake. Um, some of his men went over and they conquered Russia, and they were to hold Russia for 200 years. We're going to talk about this later, but the Mongolians held Russia for 200 years. Then a Mongolian army went into Poland. The Polish people were more able to fight than the Russians, and they battled the Mongolians to a standstill. Then the Mongolians heard that Genghis Khan had died, and they all made a long, long trip back home to find out what was going on at home once Genghis Khan had died. Um, but uh, they, they attacked Persia, Baghdad. A lot of them became less nomadic after they took over China. They took up farming, and they blended in somewhat with the Chinese ways. The new dynasty they set up was called the Yuan, and uh, its chief ruler was Kublai Khan. Now, during the time that Kublai Khan was in power, Marco Polo visited all the way from Italy. I mean, came from Italy and made this long trip. Stayed here 20 years. When he got back home, people said to him, you can't be the Polos. They've been dead for 20 years. Well, so they finally convinced that Marco Polo is real. Marco Polo wrote a book. The book influenced Christopher Columbus. And Christopher Columbus said, well, the problem that the Europeans had going to China any way they wanted to get there, they had to go through the Muslim world. Um, Columbus said, hey, if I sail straight west, I'll get there. He didn't make it. He did not seem to know that there were two big continents in his way. But the Portuguese had a better idea. They said somewhere, somewhere the continent of Africa ends. They went around Africa and got to the Far East by going around Africa. And that way Europeans were able to bypass the Muslim world and get to the Far East without going through the Muslim world. Um, the Mongol dynasty began spending money excessively on foreign campaigns, and folks, that's what destroyed the Roman Empire, and if the United States ever destroyed it, it destroyed us. The Mongolian Empire tried to conquer Vietnam. They could not, but we'll talk about this next chapter. Here's why. The Mongolians were great fighting from horseback back and swooping down. That kind of fighting does not work in the jungles of Vietnam. The Vietnamese knew how to strike from a dense undergrowth, strike, and then disappear. Strike again, and they used that same technique against the United States. And they even defeated the United States. They defeated the French before they equipped the United States. They defeated the Mongolians all the same way. Uh, guerrilla warfare. Hit and disappear. But anyway, they um, also, now, Kublai Khan tried to conquer Japan. So he sent a large fleet into Japan and the fleet met with a divine wind, which they called a kamikaze. I'm writing it down because you're going to run into that word kamikaze again. Anybody know where? Yeah. Japanese. The Japanese suicide fighters. Now, I was asked one, what's the connection between the Japanese suicide fighters from World War II and the divine wind? I honestly have to say I don't know. Except they both have to do with Japan. Uh, in the case of World War II suicide bombers, it was what Japan did when they uh, were just desperate for a victory and they couldn't get one, and they put a bunch of men in an airplane that was loaded with bombs, but the problem was the men were highly drugged, and also nobody knew that once these planes were loaded, they were really hard to steer, and most of them missed their target. But uh, nobody returned to ever tell about it, so uh, nobody knew until later they were hard to steer. But in the case of Mohammed Kublai Khan, he sent his fleet to Japan to conquer Japan. A strong wind came up and destroyed the fleet, and Japan was home free. Now, this reminds me of a story that happened in England in 1588 when Spain sent a fleet to conquer England, and a big wind came up and destroyed the Spanish fleet. And uh, Spain has not recovered from that day to this. Spain was sent back hundreds of years. Never recovered, but uh, it's very similar. Um, now, next we get to Chinese theology, which I've already mentioned. Um, Daoism and Buddhism threatened Confucianism, but Confucians triumphed, owing to possibly the fact that Buddhism did not emphasize hard work that Confucianism did, did not emphasize order that. Uh, all right. I have to say this, and I had some students who definitely strongly agreed with this. Persons who live in a tropical climate, I'm talking about this part of the world, tend to not be as industrious or as hardworking 
as persons who live in temperate climates. There might be a reason for this. In a tropical climate, you always, you can plant your crops anytime, and there's always something growing. In a temperate climate, there's always a winter coming, and you have to work hard when you can work so that you can eat during the winter time. And this might be why the temperate people are more energetic. But somehow or another, the, the religions that worked down here, Buddhism, would not do well in a temperate climate that demanded that the people get out in the spring and plow and then tend to their gardens all summer long and then harvest the gardens in the fall. It takes work to do that, folk. I have a small postage stamp garden in my house that I've had for years. So I spend a lot of time working it um, because you have to not only plant, you have to tend after it's planted, and then come harvest time, you need to harvest where the, the stuff you're growing will rot in the ground. Um, tropical people don't have to worry about harvest time, planting time, planting time is any time, harvest time is whenever you feel like it. Um, the emperors began to surround themselves with Confucian advisors. Now, uh, yeah, more so than with Buddhists, but more, but uh, more with the. Uh, I mean, partly less with Buddhists, but they would put in Buddhist advisors, but uh, more so with Confucius. Now, to adapt, Confucianism changed a little bit to a religion that we call Neo-Confucianism. <coughs> All right, Neo-Confucianism. Um, it was a little bit different, and it was more spiritual than the old Confucianism had been. Its main philosopher was Chu Si, and that's spelled H-S-U, and it's about time I changed markers. But anyway, Chu Si is the way it's pronounced. Chu Si was a fan of Mencius, as we talked about the first time we visited China. His philosophy, now folk try your best to understand this, but he believed that everything in the universe would consist of two parts, the material world, which is inferior, and the, uh, he didn't use the word spiritual because he was not that necessarily a spiritually minded man, being Confucius, but then what he called the world of order, the world of law. And it was up to us humans to try to transform and make sure we got to the world of order. He believed that humanity stood between the two worlds. On the one hand, if you let yourself, you would fall into the trap of the world of the material world and become overrun by greed and lust and all kinds of uh, temptations that would overtake you. But you had to work to make sure you put this aside and went to the world of, uh, of order. And, uh, He said that the way you do this, and folk, this is open to debate as to what he meant, but what he called the investigation of things. His teaching, by the way, was still you, and his, the things he asked was used in the civil service exams up until 1905, and his teachings, actually he was a number two philosopher in China behind Confucius. He was all the way up to uh, the time of, I mean, up to up to 1905 when uh, China was uh, the last emperor was deposed. Now, um, as is the case of so many philosophers, he wound up being executed. He was rejected. His works rejected. But within eight years after he was executed, he was promoted to honor, and his works became the standard commentaries on uh, some of the old Confucian writings. This is typical the way people have treated their religious founders, whether it be Socrates, Jesus Christ, uh, Chu Si, whatever. Oftentimes they're executed or they're not honored till after they're gone. Yang Wang Ming, and I'm running out of time fast. Yang Wang Ming um, disagreed with Chu Si. He said the best way to get to the to leave the material world and to rise higher was to understand yourself, which reminds me somewhat of Socrates as know thyself. Instead of investigating things, get, in, get to understand yourself. 
Um, Neo-Confucianism Neo -Confu never became the official religion of China. Now, I've got to close with a couple remarks. Number one, a lot of, what, of persons who have studied Chinese history believe that these philosophies did a lot to keep China from advancing. Why was that? Because Chinese emphasized morality or study of yourself more than emphasize the study of mechanics and nature and science. The other side of it was the Chinese were so concerned with morality, and here's what I want to compare it to, folk. Morality is like the brakes on a car. Hopefully all of you know your car needs brakes, but your car needs something else. Your car needs an engine. The Chinese philosophies were like a car that was all brakes and no engine. Morality will get you nowhere. It will keep you from going places you don't want to go, but it won't move you. Just like the brakes in the car, they'll get you nowhere. Now, they'll keep you out of places you don't want to get into. They won't get you anywhere. Um, the Chinese philosophers, again, they were like a car with no engine and all brakes, which might be better than a car with all engine and no brakes, but at least a car with all engine and no brakes, at least you'll get somewhere. You know, you'll probably crash along the way. You need both. Um, the Chinese also, um, well, um, the Chinese wound up, they let their big ships rot. They dissolved their banks. Now, I'll close with this. I'll close. I had a pupil come to me after a Friday class one time, and he was upset. We talked an hour. He was upset because Christianity had done so much to try to quelch scientific knowledge. I said, yes. Christianity did try to stop Copernicus and try to stop, but they tried to. Notice they tried to. Christianity did not stop scientific advancement. Go to the Islamic world, and Islam stopped scientific progress. Go to China, and the Chinese philosophers squelched and stopped their scientific progress. Christianity did not. With that, everybody have a good day.